Blog Talk Radio. Everybody and welcome to the premiere show of Real Combat Media Radio, the boxing news radio show at www.realcombatmedia.com, where we bring you up-to-date boxing and MMA news from around the globe. You can check us out at any time, and if you haven't already, be sure to follow us on Twitter, at Real Combat Media, that's at Real Combat Media, and like our fan page on Facebook, which is realcombatmedia.com. Firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm your host all the way from Manchester, England, John Campbell, or some of you may know me as Boxing John UK. You can also follow myself on Twitter, at Boxing John UK, or like my Facebook fan page, which is also Boxing John UK. Please take into account that my name is spelled J-O-N as opposed to J-O-H-N. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to my permanent co-host, Yells from the Bronx in New York, the boxing maniac himself of all boxing maniacs, Give it up for our very own man, Boogie Down Sean. Introduce yourself, Maniac. Yeah, man, here we go, man. It's the Maniac. It's it's the Maniac. You know, I definitely want to thank Real Combat Media and you, John, for giving me this opportunity, you know, to co-host this this podcast here that, um, you know, we're going to give the fans and listeners, you know, great interviews, great debates, and um, definitely give them a chance to the voice, their opinions. That's okay. You're more, you're more than welcome. Now, at any stage, if you'd like to appear on today's show, then all you need to do is give us a call at 347-324-5988. Another way to make sure your questions get heard will be to send a tweet at realcombatmedia.com. We'll be checking them throughout the show and answering as many questions as you can. Now, we have a great show planned for you. We've got interviews with Fernando Guerrero and Dante Wilder. We'll be we'll be recapping the fights at the Madison Square Garden, and we'll be looking forward at the weekend to come. Now, Dee, you was at the Madison Square Garden card. Talk about the event. What was the atmosphere like? How was it like to actually be in attendance at such a great night? Well, you know, uh, this past Saturday, you know, the atmosphere in the Garden Theater was was through the roof. You know, um, you know, I was I had the uh, you know the luck to be there. And um, it was it was a great atmosphere, you know. You had um, you had Puerto Ricans, you had Mexicans, and um, you know, you had um, mainly one of the main fighters. A lot of people came to see, you know, up and rising star and um, Kennedy Golovkin, also known as Triple G, and um, his fans were in attendance. I mean, Kazakhstan, they had their flags. I mean, they were there supporting him, man. I mean, they were louder than the Puerto Ricans, and man, I'm Puerto Rican myself. So you know, um, you know, much respect. It was great atmosphere, great atmosphere for boxing. New York City is is your definitely is one of the, the best places to fight. Four, four one zero six zero three zero um, nine. But zero. it was great, great zero. atmosphere. You know, seen a lot of people the in attendance Please there. Please record your message. <laughs> when you're finished recording, be... you may hang up or press one for more options. Looking forward, looking forward to February 9th as well. But um, you know, we also had um, we had a, a, a Puerto Rican prospect. You know, um, which wasn't on live cards, um, but they did show highlights of him. Uh, Felix Vanejo from Puerto Rico, you know, highly touted prospect. Um, top top rank has huge, um, you know, expectations for this kid, and and he won a spectacular knockout. Um, in the first round, about 15 seconds. 
So you know, I don't know if you got to see that, John. No, I didn't get to see the undercard. Who else was on the undercard? Was he any of a good fighter? Because I didn't check that out that much. Well, you, you know, we also there's yeah. also a, a local. I'm gonna have to cut you off now, Dick. It's Fernando Guerrero's life. How's it going, Mr. Guerrero? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have you. Um, now, of course, you're fighting the undefeated Peter Quillen at the Barclays Center for the WBO middleweight title on February the 9th. Are you currently in yeah. your most intense stage of planning and training? Uh, my training is going good. My training is going perfectly. Uh, we're, we're where we want to be right now, mentally, physically. Uh, we're good. Mm-hmm. Now, have you changed your training regime in any way? to take into account the fact that this is the biggest fight of your career and it's a world title fight? Have you changed your training in any way? Uh, well, you know, the training is a little bit different because of my um, of my, my new trainer. But, uh, but no, we haven't done anything differently. We've just, we just been resting a lot, training smart, um, good sparring partners. And um, like I said, you know, everything is, is, is good. And... and um, Everything that we're doing is is what we, it's it's for a cause for what we need. Mm-hmm. Now, last time we spoke, I believe it was November or December, you said you haven't seen much of Peter Quillen and you've not watched too much about him. Now, are you more informed about Peter Quillen? Have you been studying tapes? Yeah, well, I've seen I've seen some couple of tapes of him, um, and and I'm familiar with him now and everything, you know, but in the, in the boxing world, you can't you can't try to be too familiar with a person just by video because it's way different once when you step in the ring. Yeah, that's um that's a very good point. Now, what do you make of um, Rosado's performance against Gennady Golovkin last night? Because you also beat Rosado yourself. I'm just wondering to see if you yeah. think he's an improved fighter or he's the same fighter that stepped in the ring against you a couple of years back. Well, um, I don't think so. I didn't see the same. I didn't see the same fire, you know. Um, you know, you gotta, you got, you gotta believe in yourself when you step in the ring. You can't, you can't do this for the money, because if you're gonna do it for the money, then that's gonna be the, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna be the, the the results, you know. You can't, and you can't do it for just saying that I fought this guy. You gotta do it for the right reasons, and um, you know, like, like, if I mean, you know, I'm just, I mean, you never know. And once when you step in the ring, um, a lot of people think that they know what they're made of, but once when you step in the ring, then you, that's when you really find out. No. So the jury's yeah. still out on Gennady Golovkin. I know that me and my co-host have a slight disagreement about Golovkin. What do you make of Golovkin as a fighter? From your professional point of view, do you believe that he's a complete fighter? Do you believe that he's the real article? Um, say it again. Do I believe he's a complete fighter or what? Do you believe Golovkin is the real deal, or do you believe that he's a um, more of a hype? I don't. I don't. I don't consider him being a hype. Um, I think that he is what what he is. What he is, you know. He, he he's a champion. And and every time when you step in the ring, with, when when you're in that level fighting champions, you're gonna get those results. So um, he's done what he's he needed to do to get to that point. So he he's a champion. So so you know that's that's all I can say. You know he um he has power. He has a, an okay speed and he has confidence. So with confidence, you could go a long way. You know. So he's he's a good fighter. All right, thank you very much for answering my questions. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to introduce you and pass you on to my co-host from the Bronx. He's the Boxing Maniac. Go on, Boxing Maniac. Hey, Mr. Guerrero, how are you feeling this evening? I feel great. Feeling really hey, good, man. man. Thanks, man. I think, you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I know, um, you know, you got a, a huge fight coming up, and I know, you know, training is intense and whatnot. But um, my first question to you, Mr. Guerrero, is, how much pressure is on you to win this fight? See, it's a, it's a fight. Yeah, it's um. I want to know how much you know how much pressure you have. You know, going into this fight, this is obviously your biggest fight. You know, you're going up against another. 
you know, top middleweight and Peter Quillen. And um, how much pressure do you feel going into this fight? Or is it just you, you feel, you know, relaxed and, you know, it's just another fight? Yeah, I think I think um I think I feel real good. You know, I think I feel real great about this fight. Um when you're when when you've been fighting as long as I have, since the amateurs and the professional, um, you know, there's so many times that you listen to a lot of people, man, you're gonna be a champion, you're gonna be a champion, you got it. So now, um I want I I I want to to I I I want to feel like I'm a champion. I want to be a champion so bad. So I don't want I don't want those fights that I'm supposed to win. I want the fights that I'm supposed to lose and and and, and win them. You know. So I feel I feel like this is my time, and I feel like it's gonna be great. I'm fighting a guy that is that is um, strong, fast, um, and everything undefeated. So um, I feel great because because. For me, it's a win-win situation, you know. Once when, once when you put it all in the line, you know, it is what it is. You know, if you lose, you lose. But I, I'm going to go out there to put my best in, and and, and, and um, hopefully that's good enough. Love that mentality there, man. That's good. That That's the approach, you know, to have it, you know, to have in that going into every fight. It's that, you know, listen, I'm going to go in there, try my best, and you know, if if the best man, you know, just let the best man win. And um, you know, answer the question yeah, you just answered. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 I'm sorry. I was, um, but 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 you know, like I really feel like that. You know, I really feel like, oh, I mean, a loser is a guy that doesn't try. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah. I mean, once when you put two two guys, once when you put two guys in the ring, it doesn't matter how good they are. One of them is gonna lose. So the thing is, it's like I'm proud um, and, and 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 I'm hungry, but I'm also proud of being that, that in that level of eliteness. And um, I don't want to just prove it to the world. I really just want to prove it to myself what I, what I can do. You know, um, I already I think I know what I can do, but you never know what you can do until you're in that ring. You could you could be you could be outside of the ring and say, Oh no, I can do this and I can do that. But once when you step in, that's when you really know what you can do. And and um, I'm not just gonna surprise the world. I'm not just gonna surprise myself. I'm gonna surprise. I'm, I don't know. It's like you know, like I feel so good about this that um, that that it's just no worries because because uh, it doesn't matter, man. It's, it's it's just a sport. And 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 you know, if you really feel like a man, you. When you feel like a man, you gotta feel like you're the best, and, and and that's how I feel. I feel like I'm the best. Peter Quillen is a is a good fighter, and um um our best of luck to him. But once when I get in that ring, I'm, I'm I just I just wanna once when I step in there, I don't wanna leave nothing unturned. I wanna feel like okay, if he beat me, he beat me because he's better man. But if, mm-hmm. but but if but knowing that I'm the better man, I don't I don't see myself losing because. I have so much confidence in me, and, and and I just feel good about this, man. All right, all right, yeah, I hear that. Now, you know, especially a fight of this magnitude for you, we know going into these fights a huge thing is preparation. Now, you had mentioned in the first question I asked you about, you know, Peter Quillen is fast and he has power. Now, were you able to see his last fight? Um, yes, I'm sorry about that. All right. Now, if you saw in his last fight, you know, he knocked down um knocked down about about four or six times, I believe. And um but if you notice in the rounds that he didn't knock him down, he pretty much lost them. So do you think Peter Quillen is a fighter who's gonna just try to come in, knock you out? And if you feel that maybe if you could withstand that first rush of him trying to knock you out, that you could outbox him and, and possibly, you know, give him a lot of problems. Um, well, you know, just like I was telling um, um, the the other guy, like when people ask me that, you know, um, I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen in that ring. 
All I know, all I know is, is like I'm gonna retaliate everything that he brings, you know. So um, he's a man, and I'm a man, you know. And I feel like, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, you know, you, you gotta have that pride in you. Um, I've never fought nobody that that is stronger than me or faster than me. Even if they were stronger or faster, I I, I still felt like I was stronger and faster, you know. So. Um, I don't know. It's just like you know, like I, I don't, I don't see nobody overpowering me. I don't see nobody overseeing me. You know, it's it's that pride. So so the thing is, is whatever he brings for me, if I if I if I allow somebody to beat me just because they could punch or just because they're faster, they're not even one of that bad. You know, mentally yeah. and physically, your body could do stuff that you don't even know. So so when I when when I'm when I get in that ring, um, I'm gonna answer all those questions and more. So I all, all I all I want to do is I just I just can't wait to really show myself, not just the whole world, but myself what I'm really capable of doing. And um, Guerrero, who so who are you sparring now? Who who are your sparring partners? Um, this this helping you prepare for this Peter Quillen fight. Oh, well, I got these two guys that, um, um, no, well, I was following with three guys and then the other one, um, um, the other, the other one didn't come or whatever, but I, I'm, I've been sparring all together, yeah, three guys. And, um, and, and, and just like Virgil told me, you know, just don't, don't beat them up because you're not going to fight them. You're going to fight, um, you're, you're going to fight Peter Cullen. So it's okay if the guys, hit you or it's okay if you do mistakes because we're working on fighting Peter Cullen and not fighting the small partners, you know? So um, I think I got good good planning and, and good spawn partners. But like I said, you know, once when <laughs> it doesn't matter who I spawn. I could I could I could be sparring um Oscar De La Hoya, Peter Trinidad. They're not gonna get it I'm, those are not the guys that I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna fight Peter Quillen. So um, once when I step in the ring, you know, that's who I'm going to fight. So um, the spawn partner is important and everything, but um, you can't just rely on just the sparring because I'm not going to fight them. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. Now, Guerrero, me, you know, I'm from, you know, from the Bronx, New York. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican and um, you're Dominican now. You know, I was raised with Dominicans, got family that's Dominican. Now, you're fighting in New York City. So, do yeah. you are you expecting, you know, a decent Dominican crowd to come? Because, you know, Dominicans support, you know, they, they people. I've, 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 like I said, I've grown up around them my whole life. And, um, you know, they, they do come to support. So, you know, are you expecting to see some, um, you know, banderas dominicano? Well, listen, um, I'm I'm Dominican, right? And then the thing about Dominican Republic are just are just Latinos, you know. We're we're so used of just like being together and and, and yeah. performing, and it's all about pride. So that's why I say, and um, I I don't mean to um, I don't mean to change the the subject or anything, but I'm gonna change up the language right now. So if y'all don't mind. No me importa lo que yo voy a hacer. No, no me importa nada. Lo único que me importa es de mi país. Eh, 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 ser el orgullo de mi país. ¿Me entiendes? Ser el orgullo latino. Nosotros somos latinos. Nosotros no podemos tenerle miedo a nadie. ¿Tú sabes? Porque yo lo hice ese domingo encima, encima de un burro con, 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 con hambre y todo. Así que, que, que tenerle te, temor a una persona that's what I'm saying about me. I understand. Yes. So, so like, like, I, like I said, you know, the, the least of my words would be to um, the least of my words would be to 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 have fear another man that breathes the same air that I breathe. That's yeah. that's the easy part. Listen, yeah, boxing not... compared to life, it's 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 easy, you know, because life is hard. I mean, all my peoples in the Dominican Republic. You know what I'm saying. When I was in the Dominican Republic, I had to carry all those buckets. I had to do this and I had to do that. And the other thing is this. It's nothing compared to other to what other people had to do. I didn't have it hard. 
So what? I didn't. I didn't have no no food. So what? I didn't. I, I didn't have no electricity. So what? A lot of people live that that way. You know, it's, it's the way of the world. You know, some people grow up in BMWs and and, and, and big houses. You know, I, I grew up in the slums, and, and I was still rich in my own way because I had what I needed. So me fighting Peter Quillen is 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 me fighting Peter Quillen, and 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 me showing myself in the whole world that Dominicans, that 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 people from Salzburg. Salisbury, Maryland, from a small town. I didn't have to grow up poor. I didn't have to be in in in, uh, in the streets and the drugs or 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 without parents or anything. I didn't, no, I'm just a guy that that came to America and trying to better myself. So if if it's me boxing or me playing basketball or me doing whatever, you know, it's just putting effort and 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 not having fear of nothing. You know, I have 26 fights. I lost one fight. Who cares? You know why? Because I beat twenty five people, and they're and 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 that means that if they can lose, I can lose too. You know, and 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 I'm not, and, and I'm not, I'm not God. You know, so if that's what God wanted me to do to lose, and I'm still here, I don't care. As long as I lose and I feel good about it, um, I feel like I, I go out flat, out in my back, and I gave it all I got. Then I don't care. But the thing is that, um, dude, February the ninth, we're gonna fight, and all I want to do is just hit him one time, you know? <laughs> because that's all that's all I want to do. All right, right guys. That's, all right, guys. Yeah, that's, we're gonna wrap it up and move on. Thank you very much, Mister Guerrero, for coming on. I wish you the best of luck. Real Combat Media is fully behind you, and um, hopefully we can get you on the show with a belt around your waist. Okay, well, thank, thanks a lot, and um, everybody, you know, just well, right, right, cheer for me, you. cheer for Peter Cullen. We're just going to give a great show. All right. I Take appreciate care. your Take time, care. Mr. Guerrero. Have a good night. Y Dominicano, vamos. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, D, what do you make of that guy? Do you think he's got a chance on February the night? You know, um... You know, it's... it's You know, he's he absolutely... He's the underdog in this fight. But um um Guerrero's a live dog here, man. Um he, he has a great chance of beating Peter Quillen. Um Peter Quillen showed that um he, he, he can be outboxed. You know, Guerrero has a decent KO percentage, but he can also box, man. I mean, this is a fight where, you know, you you just listening to this interview, man. Guerrero his emotions, he he's he's pretty much why he's saying, Listen, I grew up in the in the freaking gutter. You know, I grew up dirt poor. And look where I'm at now. You understand? Like, this is nothing. To go fight a Peter Quillen, this is nothing to me. I'm going to go in there and give him my all. And, and, and when, you know, when fighters like that, they come in with that mentality where they're not stressing themselves. Everything's about the fight. They know this thing's bigger than this. He's going to go in there with a relaxed Your mind. Been forwarded and to you know he can win that fight. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this fight, man. I mean, I, I still give the advances to Peter Quillen, but um, I think this is going to be a hell of a fight. And um, Fernando Guerrero, he's going to try to surprise a lot of people going forward. You know, this is his big, this is his biggest fight in his career. You know, it's for world championship. He'd be oh, a real good player. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hello, uh, D, I've got to cut you off now. We've got Dante Wilder on the phone, Olympic bronze medalist, and undefeated, twenty six and zero, twenty six knockouts. How's it going, Mr. Wilder? He said, just give him a second. He said, just hold on. Yeah, but I, I, I like, I like, um, I like Guerrero, um, you know, to be a live dog in that Quillen fight. You know, Quillen, Quillen loads up a lot. You know, um, he, he has good boxing skills, but I think he, he relies on his power a lot. And, um, you know, maybe in this fight that, that could be, that could be an Achilles heel for him. You know, if he can't really land nothing flush on Guerrero. You know, so um, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to see how this fight plays out. Okay. You know, have, have we got Mr. Wilder on the phone? Are you there, Mr. Wilder? I don't believe we've got him on the phone. Let me try that once more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, February 9th, man. Hope everybody's getting their tickets, especially anybody in the, in the tri-state area. 
You know the maniac could be in there along with everyone else. So it should be a fun night of boxing that night. You know. Yeah, man. But you know, Guerrero, man, he made me a fan right now, man. What why he said I Your could relate been to forwarded to an automatic voice message. I could relate to a lot, man. And um, you know, it's 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 the struggle, man. It's it's the struggle and um I like I like his mentality going into this fight. You know, hopefully okay, he can, you know uh, Okay, we can't get through to Mr. Wilder at this time, but we'll try him again in, say, 10, 15 minutes now. We have plenty of results to announce from the weekend just past. We'll be discussing in detail the three title fights which happened at Madison Square Garden. These were Mikey Garcia versus Orlando Salido, Juan Carlos Burgos versus Roman Rocky Martinez, and, of course, the main event, the WBA middleweight title between Gennady Golovkin and Gabriel Rosado. We'll also be discussing Gabriel Campillo versus... Sergei Kovalov in some detail. Once we've covered last weekend, we'll be looking forward at the weekend ahead, focusing primarily on the Showtime card at Las Vegas. We'll be discussing the two biggest fights on that card, which is Lucas Matisse versus Mike Dallas Jr. at 140, and the other fight covered will be Selkuk Aydin versus Jesus Soto Carras. The third fight we'll talk about is in Verona, New York, and on ESPN. In the middleweight division, we have Sergei Zizurik, versus Brian Vera. Of course, there's a lot more fights coming this weekend, and stay tuned because you'll find out about them also. Before we get started, I'd like to direct you to the RCM store, which is on our website at www.realcombatmedia.com. Here you can find a range of great products such as the Elevation Mask, which is used by many top athletes to simulate training at high altitude. No longer we need to travel all the way to the hills. We also have Alpha Brain, a great new innovative product on the market which opens up your intellectual channels and allows you to think clearer. If you want hemp protein, look no further. The RCM store can provide this for you, the best protein in the land. If all of this isn't enough for you, type in the code Real Combat Media when prompted on the RCM store and you'll receive a 10% discount on all our goods. With that being said, let's get started. Now, yes. last Saturday I hosted a big show at Madison Square Garden, three title fights, it took place on HBO, but we'll discuss the main event between the undefeated WBA middleweight champion and Olympic silver medalist Gennady Golovkin and the tough Philadelphian challenger moving up from light middleweight Gabriel Rosado. Now, the result was a seventh-round stoppage of Rosado by Gennady Golovkin in a bloody, brutal affair when his corner had to, had to throw the towel in. Now, D, you was there. How did you like this fight? Yeah, um, you know... You know, seeing it, seeing it live, um, I, I really felt that um, Rosado, he gave too much respect to Triple G. And um, he seemed on his bike early in the fight. You know, he didn't he didn't sit on his punches. You know, he's kind of jabbing, you know, but, you know, leaning away. You're not going to be effective like that. You know, Golovkin, you know, pretty much just came straight forward this fight. You know, he, he was doing a good job of cutting off the ring. And um, he just, you know, he was slicing Rosado up, man, like a like a pizza pie, you know, just slicing them up. And um, you know, I mean, the the, the results wasn't pretty for Rosado. I mean, Rosado did land some shots, you know. Some people, you know, a lot of people say, oh, why did he land? Why did listen? Rosado landed shots on Golovkin. Now, did it hurt Golovkin? Uh, no, but he felt it. You saw it in his face, you know, and um. Golovkin was there to be hit. Yeah, now, a serious cut opened above Rosado's eye, and there was blood everywhere. It was all over Golovkin. It was all over Rosado. The ring was a bloody brutal mess. It looked like a war zone. Now, we all knew Rosado at no point would want the fight to be stopped, and he begged the ringside doctor. He begged the ringside doctor not to, not to stop the fight, and it took his corner. It took his corner to stand up and throw the towel in for the fight to be stopped. Now, to big up Rosado and give my respect to him, I'd like to point out that CompuBox calculated that Golovkin landed 42% of his punches over the course of seven rounds. Now, of course, I can't give Rosado too much credit because the, the aim of the game is not to get hit. But with that being said, I challenge any fighter, any fighter at 160 to go seven rounds with Gennady Golovkin, who's throwing 42% of his punches, for a guy moving up in weight to manage that and need his corner to step in to stop it, this guy's got balls. He's done himself proud. 
and the badge and the and the badge of honour should be the scars, bruises, and cuts that he has. What do you think, there? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of hundred and you know a lot of middleweights that are um, you know supposedly ducking um Triple G. Nobody seems to want to fight him. I mean, Rosado did move up from 154, you know, to fight arguably the uh, the, the most duck fight in boxing as we speak, you know, and um. The results weren't good. But, um, you know, Golovkin is looking to fight four to five times this year. And, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of fighters at 160 that could be made. You know, we got – you have Matthew Macklin. You know, you have, uh, you know, the winner of, of Mundine, um, Degel. You got D- Dimitri Parag, who was supposed to fight Golovkin but got injured. And um, Praska ended up um, substituting for him. So, um. You know, there's a lot of fighters, and um, you know, like I said, like we spoke earlier, I would love to see a Triple G versus Chavez Jr. And the reason why is that Chavez Jr. is not going to respect Triple G like these other fighters. He's going to come forward. So I'm looking forward to it. that fight. Is intrigues me a lot. Right. Okay. So D, we had this discussion earlier. Come on, let's bring it on the air. The thing that a lot of casual fans don't realise about Gennady Golovkin, and I'll let you say your piece on this, when they say ridiculous things like, oh, Golovkin's just an overrated slugger, he's this, he's that, is, he's got a lot more to his game. Now, first of all, he's an extremely skilled boxer, and if you, if you can't see this by his pro fights, look at his amateur career. He was part of the Kazakh programme, which is one of the top five programmes in the world. He won a silver medal in Athens, a gold medal in the World Championships, at amateur, he's beat the likes of Andre Durrell, he's beat Mushin Butte, he's beat Andy Lee also. Gennady Golovkin is the real deal, and if you don't know now, you will do in a year's time. He's already got the tools. The only guy at 160 today, and I put it to you, that can beat Gennady Golovkin is Sergio Martinez. Now, I know you ain't going to bash Golovkin, but you disagree with me slightly on this. I'm going to give you a piece on this, dude. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, I'm not going to grab my... Gennady Golovkin pom poms just yet. You know, obviously the fighter more exactly more suitable that has the style that seems like the style that that um that a trouble Golovkin and probably beat him is of course um Sergio Martinez. But like I said, a fight a fight with a, a Chavez Junior it it's an intriguing matchup. Nobody has yet to buzz him. You know, he walked down Andy Lee. I mean, say what you want about Andy Lee, but the guy hits hard. Chavez Jr. walked right through him. You know, that's something I would like to see Golovkin fight, a fighter like that. And Chavez Jr. is Mexican. We know how these Mexican fighters are. They're going to try to die in that ring, you know. And I want to see him with with the P, you know Peter Quillen. And who knows, maybe the winner of this fight you know, February 9th, um, Guerrero and Quillen, you know, you know, could be a future opponent for Triple G. I mean, he, he'll, right now, from what he did to a, a junior middleweight and a top 10 fighter in Prosca, you know, I know a lot of people like, oh, my God, this guy's phenomenal. And so far, so good. But you have to keep proving yourself against elite fighters. Now, right now, he's passing the eye test. You know, same thing Lamir Khan did. Same thing Victor Ortiz did. And what happened to them guys? You end up getting beat up. Now, they still good fighters, but the hype wasn't there. Right now, Golovkin, you know, he definitely has potential. I'm not taking nothing away from the guy. His potential is there. But for me to say, oh, my God, this is the guy, forget about it. He's a, I can't. I have to see it first. And when it happens, then, like I told you, I'll be the first to admit, hey, this is the guy. But the future looks bright. So far, so good. But you have to keep on winning. That's the name of the game. Now, I don't see Golovkin getting the Martinez fight, unfortunately. So if I was him, I'd just sit tight and continue to do what he's doing, fighting the best guys out there who are able and willing to fight him, unify the titles if he can, but we all know Daniel Gill stepped down for the WBA, and interested at this moment at least. Wait for some of the young guys at 154, such as Austin Trout and Canelo, to move up in weight 
because chances are these could be the guys that give him the career-defining fighters that he wants. Now, the thing with Golovkin is his offense is brilliant. It was so precise last night and patient. As always, despite the fact that he said he wasn't too pleased with his performance, he doesn't rush in, he doesn't overcommit to minimize the risk of getting countered or walking onto a big shot. You see, he's always thinking about what could happen and taking a step ahead. He keeps his punches long and crisp, meaning that every shot he throws is convincing and doesn't possess the sloppiness that some fighters do. The way he starts his opponent starts in a mature way. He lets them make mistakes and lets the fights come to him, and he takes advantage of people's mistakes like a predator. Do you agree? He, he from what from what we see, yes, yes, he, he has done that. You know, um, he's very patient. You know, he doesn't overcommit. I mean, but he's also there to be hit. Like I said, when when there's a fighter that that can move and has more pop than a Rosado or Prasca, you know, then then we're going to really see, you know. I mean, how does he react to that? Because the better fighters he fight, the harder they're going to hit for the most part, you know. And um, so far he show, he's showing a good chin, but his chin will be tested. You know, there's going to be somebody that's going to land some bombs on that boy, and we're going to see. Now, yes, I might be sounding like a, a Triple G hater, but I'm not a hater. I'm just stating the facts. Yes, so far he's looking like a monster. Yes, he is. But I can't call him that if he's not if he's doing that to Peter Quillen, if he's doing that to Matthew Macklin, if he's doing that to Chavez Jr., then holy ish, then you got to say, Dan, look what he's doing to these fighters. Now, people's going to say, well, nobody wants to fight him. And we spoke about this before, earlier, John. How about it? He might have to move up or he might have to go down. He said he can make 154. Abel Sanchez said he can make 154. He can make 168. Is it fair to him? No, it's not fair. You understand? This fight is at 160. They should fight him. But like I tell you, this is a business. What, you're going to put your career on hold, waiting for fighters to fight you, or you're going to just go out there and look for the best fights available? Okay, yeah, I, I completely agree. Now, we're going to try and get Dante Wilder on the phone one more time, so bear with me, guys. Yeah, man, but, um, you know, Triple G, you know, like I said, man, so far so good. So, you know, I'm eager Hello? to see who he fights Hello, next. Wilder, um, one Real Combat Media Radio, how's it going? Yeah, can you hear me, Mr. Wilder? Yeah, yeah I hear you, man. Yeah, how's it going now? Congratulations on your win over Matthew Gray last night, but let's keep it real. We don't really want to talk to you about that. We want to talk to you about you and your future. Now, we all know you won the Olympic bronze medal in Beijing, but what a lot of people don't know about you is that you won it over after three years of boxing. You'd only been boxing three years. You went to the Olympics and won the gold medal. I mean, the bronze medal, sorry. Now, how was the whole Olympic experience for you? I mean, the whole Olympics too was great. You know, um, I was the first ever to make the Olympics team and medal in a year and a half. You know, I, I, I was for a year and a half and made the Olympics and even medal on top of that. You know, a lot of guys came to the Olympics uh, empty-handed and left empty-handed. But, you know, I left with some. And uh, it, was, it was it was a great experience for me, you know, just to do the things I, I've done. You know, I work hard in the gym to do the things I, I, I do. And, uh, you know, and to, to, God, to God be the glory for everything for me. Mm-hmm. Now, how on earth, what is your secret? Like, how are you knocking, like, everybody out? You've got 26 wins and 26 knockouts. Nobody's gone past four rounds with you. Now, is there some form of special kind of training that you do to make you ridiculously strong? Or is it just you know, something that you're born with? Like, come on. Well, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm, a naturally, I'm a natural strong person, though. I've always been, been strong um, uh, throughout my Throughout just coming up as a boy, um, but um, no, it's it's no no kind of secret training I do. I just whatever I do, I just work hard at what I do, you know. And the power is just it's, it's crazy. Sometimes it scares me that you know <laughs> just to see how 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 strong I am when I hit a person that the, the impact that would happen because there's one or two things going to happen when I hit you. One, you either get bubble and have fall, or you're going to get knocked out. It's going to be a, about a good night. You know, and um, you know that, that's something that, that I haven't came to you. Sometimes when I do the things I do, and when I knock people out, I'm like, wow! It's always a surprise for me as well, too. Still to this day, I'm like, wow! How in the world, you know, every guy I'm touching, 
that is, is falling. A lot of people think, oh, you're going to get up. I know one day I'm going to get to a guy that 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 can withstand my punches. And my argument is that is the body, the head is not meant to be hit. So, you know, a, a man can only take so many punches until he, until he falls. Yeah, and that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're right, and It's like a horse's kick. It's, it's, it's unreal. I can't imagine anybody being able to take that power from you. But, um, now, you've been criticized by a lot of skeptics, and a lot of people are getting frustrated saying that the level of competition you face ain't brilliant. But I personally, be- I personally believe that it's not your choice. You, I, I believe that you're willing to fight anybody, Mr. Wilder, now. Um, what's the reason for this? Is it your promoters? Is it the fact that nobody wants to fight you? What, what's going on with that? Man, when it, the thing is, when it comes to Deontay Wilder, man, um, a lot of people is gonna 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 slow walk and crawl to to fight me. You know, I'm not one of those type of guys that where people see that oh I I could beat him, so let me get a fight, let me run and try to fight and beat him. You know, a lot of people are seeing the knockouts and seeing how I'm knocking people out, and you know who who who's gonna want to fight a guy that knocks everybody out, no matter what the level of competition is. I'm knocking everyone out, and a lot of a lot of great fighters have fought lower competition, but they haven't knocked them out. They're not knocking them out. And what I'm doing, I'm knocking everything out. So we didn't have a lot of great guys that submitted their names in. We didn't have a guy that we went after. And the thing that people don't know, a lot of, a lot of them turn me down or they, they, they make it make the contract so so that it, it is not going to make a fight happen. What they want, or they want this, they want that, or they want more money. or It's always something when they come to me. But, you know, now at this point in time, you know, um, it, it's definitely about that time, man. There's a lot of things that's, that's going to be done. You know, um, there's a lot of fights that I want because you, you're right. I don't run from nobody. I don't love nobody. And uh, when they're at the end, it's not up to me. It's my promotion company and as well as other fighters as well, too. But nobody's not just going to legitimately want to fight me because they know it's a it's a, a 50-50 chance that I may lose or win against this guy. Yeah, and uh, now if you could choose your next opponent tomorrow, who would it be? Repeat that again, please. If you could choose your next opponent tomorrow, who would it be? Uh, any, anybody at the top. I want, I want, I want them all. I want, I, you know, I'm a type of fighter that I want to please my fans as well too. Or, or if you're not a fan of mine, just a fan of of the sport of boxing. You know, uh, I want to get everybody to fight. But you know, the thing is, especially for me, and and as well, I can speak for the other fighters as well too. Like we don't want to fight. We don't want to fight the, the top guys where people want to see what it is, is when it's when we fight for pennies. You know, we got families to feed. We want to be able to to benefit from it as well too. Because the fans, they don't they don't care if you how much money you're making. They just want to see the fight happen. And um, for the fighter and for the fighter, we don't want to just be fighting for nothing just to please the fans. We want to make money and support our family because this is what we do too. So. You know, a lot of it's, it's, it's a lot of big rotation of things, and um, it's a lot of fights that the fans gonna get to see, and a lot of fights that they're not gonna get to see. That's just the way it is, or just a part of life. All right, I believe we've got a caller who might want to ask you a question. Bear with me one second. Okay. Hello, you're on the yeah, Real sir. Combat Media Radio. How's it going? Good, good. How you doing, John? Yeah, how's it going? What's your name? Where are you from? This is Nick Belafato, actually. I, I uh. Oh, I put some articles in with Real Combat Media. How you doing? Yeah, that's right. I know who you are. Would you like to ask Mr. Wilder a question? Yeah, of course I got a question for Deontay. Um, I'm curious to know where where you're at as far as what Mark Breland thinks. Where, where, where Deontay, does Mark Breland think you're at? What does he think you're ready for? He's your trainer. He works with you. He probably right. knows you better than anybody else because... He probably trains more rounds with you than the fighters are lasting. So where, where does he think you're at in terms of, uh, you know, your level of competition and what you're able to deal with right, at right. this point in time? Yeah, Mark. Mark understands the whole the whole process because he 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 have dealt with it in his career as well too with the, with the, with the different things. He um he feels that I, I am ready for whoever as well too. But you know. You're always gonna gonna have those things where you still need to work on this. You still need to work on that. That's gonna be with any fighter, you know. Um, he he feel that way, you know. You know, we got some good. We he know that we have some things that we need to work on as well too. But for us, when they're dealing with anybody in the world to fight, he 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 definitely feel that I can run with anybody in the world. You know, we we're confident. You know, I don't have no yes men in my corner. I don't have people that just tell me what I want to hear. Oh, you the champ. This is me. They give it to me straight, and that's how I like it. And um, 
my whole team. You know, we de- we definitely big up the bomb squad because we definitely up in here. And um, man, and I, I want to get the people what they want to see. I really do. You know, if it was up to me, and I ran everything. Uh, you know, a- everything could be done because I'm definitely a competent fighter. I'm competent what I do. I'm competent, and um, being the next big thing, man. And um, soon, soon everybody should see. All yeah, right. and now the other thing, the other thing is, um, I mean, I, I realize you got to build yourself up. You, you've been building yourself up at a certain level. Who would you like to take on next? You know, before you start to start hitting the top tier guys. Who, who's on your radar? I mean, give me a few names. They might be listening in. You never know. Well, well, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people talk, always talk about, you know, American this, American that. I wouldn't mind taking out all the Americans. So if I take out all the Americans. You know, we we, we won't have the we don't have a misunderstanding of who's the number one American. You know, I want to take them all out of the picture, but there's only one American, that's Deontay Wilder. And then and then then from there, just take on everybody in the world, everybody from the world, whether I get to travel over there or they travel over here. You know, and um, I'm comfortable with traveling anywhere in the world. You know, I really am. I, I got friends all over the world. I've been all over the world, so it it would be great for not only just for me but the fans as well too. They can come and see me live and in person. Okay, D. Would you like to ask Mr. Wilder any questions? Nick Bellacott, stay on the line for now. Absolutely. Mr. Wilder, how are hey, you? How the boxing maniac. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, sir? Um, I'm good, Mr. Wilder. Um, Wilder, question here. We know that um boxing was built on the heavyweight division. You know, we know that right. you know, all the golden eras was heavyweight, you know, we could go on forever talking about all the greats. Now, you just had mentioned about you want to take out all the American heavyweights. Now, there's there's a couple of names that come to mind. And, you know, um, you have Brian Jennings and, um, you know, you have Seth Mitchell, which he just lost his first fight, but he's having the rematch with Banks. So, um, Correct. You, you, you and Jennings in the future, is that a fight you can see? Oh, most definitely. Most, I, you know, personally, personally, I want I want Jennings for the simple fact of of his promotion coming. You know, Jennings haven't really said much to me as far as you know him him wanting me, and for as on a uh, personal level, for as his promotion company. And I was telling his promotion company that you you know you can do all this talk for him, but you're not going to be able to fight in the ring when that boy get in that ring. And whatever you send to me, I'm going to take it out on him. So it's going to be and everybody people that know me know me when it becomes a personal issue for me. I'm, I'm willing to go in there and, and rip your head off. So uh, that Jimmy's fight would definitely would definitely be a, a, a fight, definitely in, um, if if not soon, soon in the future. You know, I, I definitely want that fight. Many uh, many other fans want it, and I think it's becoming a big thing here in America. Wilder versus Jimmy thing. So after a while, it's going to evolve to something that they're going to be a must happen. I want that to be a must for me. Okay, yeah, that that that's what I, I like. That that's what I like to hear. Now, obviously, you know, 26 and 0, 26 knockouts. Man, I'm not a mathematician, but shit, even I know that's a 100% knockout ratio. And um, we know Americans love knockouts. We love knockouts here. And you in the right division, the heavyweight. So you feel, do you feel you can be that guy to bring the heavyweight division back to America? Because it's been dominated by the Klitschko's for a lot of years. Can you be that guy? Correct, correct. Man, you know what? I, I carried America on my back in the Olympics all by myself, and I'm willing to do it one more time for America to carry all the belts back you know, for, in, in the pros of the heavyweight division. You know, um, the Cliscos, I understand how, why they have been dominant under the sport of the sport for so long. They work extremely hard to be on top. Once you get on top, people don't understand. You have to work extra hard to stay on top. It's the point. It ain't the point. Of, the hard part is not get to the top. It's to stay there. And um, they've been working super hard and been doing all the great things to get there. But I have, I have been there. I understand. I have seen, and I got the same principles and work ethic as they do. And um, and soon, 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 I will, I will own that throne. I promise you that. All right, Mr. Wilder. Um, I'm going to let you go now. Thank you very much for taking the time. And one day, hopefully, you can come back as heavyweight champion of the world. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Boom squad. <laughs> no. yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Wilder. Have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Confident Dante Wilder, possible future heavyweight champion of the world. What do you think his chances are, D? I mean, wow. Listen, man. Um, he, he 
I mean, the proof is in pudding, man. The guy has, you know, a 100% knockout ratio. Now, yes, his competition has been very, very limited, you know, very limited. We can't argue that, you understand, and um, it is what it is. But, um, you know, his time will come, and look what he just said. He said he wants Brian Jennings. He said that's a fight that he wants. He said it lies. So, you know, that's something that needs to be put out there because everyone is calling Brian Jennings the best American heavyweight. But, um, you know, Deontay Wilder said he wants that fight. And he said that, <laughs> um, you know, um, Jennings' promotional company could do all the talking for him. But they can't help him once he's in that ring. So, you know, that's a fight I'm looking forward to, the two top American heavyweights. All right, um, we, Nick, Nick Bellafat, are we still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm listening in. All right, okay. Do you want, um, I'm happy for you to stay on the line if you want, Mr. Bellafat. Are we going to be discussing Garcia Salido right now? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good topic there. Okay, also, I've got Mario Munguia on the line. Hello, hey, Mario yeah, Munguia. I'm... How's it going? How's it going, John? Yeah, I'm good. Welcome to the show for the first time. How does it feel? Thanks, man. Thanks. No, it's it's great. I was sitting back listening. Uh, I enjoyed the interview with Wilder. I always enjoy the Maniac, man. Just, I, I'm going to tell you this right now, you know, just a side note. There, people with blog talk radio shows, they're going to have a real problem when uh, the Maniac wises up one day and uh, gets his own show and puts us all out of business. That guy, is, uh, he's, uh, he's good, man, on the mic. Real good, but uh, yeah, man. Maybe I love a while. No way. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, Wilder. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Oh, okay, Wilder was great. Mario, we need to move on, guys. Now, moving on to last Saturday, we're going to move on to the young and talented Mikey Garcia, who took the WBO featherweight title of the world in a tough fight against Orlando Salido. Now. What do you think of this fight, D? What do you make of this fight? Wow. You see, this is this was the fight that was gonna define, you know, uh Mikey Garcia. Whether he was for real or whether he was just, you know, hype. And obviously, woo that boy put a whipping on Salito. He put a whipping on four knockdowns, two in the first round. He he nearly had um Salito's right eye shut closed. I mean it was it was ugly in there. Now Salito, one thing you have to mind from Salito is that he's he's relentless, man. And and it definitely has to go back to you know the Mexican roots, man. The Mexican fighters are real real relentless when when they in that ring. And Salito kept coming forward and coming forward, never got discouraged, but you know, the big the big thing in this fight was the headbutt. Now, there's there's you know there's different opinions. Some people felt it was intentionally. Some felt it was accidental. Some people felt that Garcia quit. Some people felt he could have kept going. You know, now that's all a matter of opinion. You know, so from my standpoint, I think that. Garcia could have gone, he could have kept fighting, but I guess they knew that fight was in the bag, and, um, you know, um, his, 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 um, you know, his uh, corner decided to tell him, you know, that's it, we can't go no more. What do you thought? Mm -hmm. What was your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to clear that up. The stoppage came at the end of the eighth round when Mikey Garcia's nose was broken by what was ruled to be an accidental headbutt by Salido. Now, the jury's still out of whether that was an intentional headbutt or not. I don't think that's really the important point. The, like, the whole discussion of whether it was not, it can, we can argue about this all day. What I am disappointed about is the fact that this fight got stopped because I wanted to see four more rounds of greatness by a 25-year-old Mikey Garcia. So young, but yet so mature and so talented. What do you think, Nick? Well, you know, um, for me, I, you know, I, to be honest, I picked Salido to win because, like, like the other gentleman was saying, that, you know, Mikey, this was a test for Mikey Garcia. He never really stepped up to this level 
I mean, Bernabe, Concepcion, and Mauricio Pastrana, those guys, they're, they're not on Toledo's level. I picked Toledo to win because I thought, because he has a little bit of Hershey Jerk, Bob and Weave style, that he wouldn't be as available to be hit. Um, and and uh, obviously he was. But the biggest, the telling thing for me is after the second round, um, and I disagree with the other callers, that um, he did look discouraged. You know, I looked at him on his stool, and he just had a discouraged look. He didn't have the offensive output um, for a few rounds. He started coming on a little bit later, but he did, he wasn't early on. So I don't know if he wasn't warmed up or he didn't come in, come in uh, you know, uh, you know, if he came in dry or what. But, again, I, I, the most uh, impressive thing about Garcia was his composure throughout the whole thing. Um, he was well. He, he's, like, beyond his years as far as uh, ring generalship. And that was the most impressive thing to me. I mean, Toledo's been down on the canvas before. That wasn't surprising. wasn't surprising that he got up. But, I mean, his offensive output kind of declined early on. And, again, I think Garcia had a lot to do with it. He's maybe got more heavy hands than – people suspect, and uh, I was just impressed by his composure. Now, we saw everything from Garcia in this fight, a full repertoire, which included uppercuts, right hands, left hooks. We didn't see too many big combinations, but it wasn't the fight for him to do that. Defensively, we saw just enough footwork to keep him away from his man, but not running away or dancing excessively as a way of wasting energy, which is really mature and really good for a 25-year-old fighter. Now, my point is, before the Salido fight, he hasn't been tested, and now we can't really say that anymore because he's beat arguably the best in the division in a completely dominating fashion. I want to see him right away go for Pansy de Leon and Billy Dib, and then even the guys at Super Bantamweight, these three kingpins at Super Bantamweight in Mars, Redondo, and Anito Denaire. I want to see him fight the best guy out of those. What do you think, Mario? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was a coming out party. Uh, you know, of course he hadn't been tested like this, but he hadn't really gotten the opportunity to fight someone like this either. I, I mean, Salido is legit. You know, he, he's a great fighter. But at the same time, when you when you look at his style and you look at the style matchup, and, you know, I was on record for weeks saying that I didn't think this was going to be a very competitive fight. I really didn't. Now, at the same time, I didn't think this was going to be a whitewash the way it was. You know, I predicted like a 9-3 fight. Um, and Garcia, you know, he came out with a point to prove. It, it was relentless. The kind of performance that Garcia had it is phenomenal. It, it's epic. It's game-changing in fans' eyes because immediately after the fight's over, I'm seeing tweets, matching with Donaire, you know, matching with Gamboa, matching with, you know, all the big names, all the guys that surround uh, or hover around the pound-for-pound pound list or even in the pound-for-pound pound list. That's pretty, uh, you know, remarkable. When you think of a guy that probably very few people out of the hardcores know, and now he's being plunged into that limelight. But the thing is, I think he's, I think he's legit. I think he's the goods. I think he's a better version, a bigger version than Abner Mates. I think he's uh, he blows Mates out of the water. To be, you know, quite honest, and that's the fight everybody wants to make with Donaire. You know, that Mates Donaire. That's a fight that I want to see, but it's not the fight that I think is the best. Garcia Donaire could be a real show. Now, of course, you know they have the same promoters, and I mean, I'm sorry, the same managers, uh, trainers, and, and and you know, so on, and and so you know, the fight is probably not logical, but theoretically, I, I think it's a really great matchup. You know, Garcia is big enough. Uh, you know he he's got the goods, and so yeah, I would love to see him in there with the with the best and the cream of the crop. But at at the same time, John, I do agree with you. Those are two great names. Uh, you know he should get the chance to defend his belt in the division. Billy did. You know uh, Ponce de Leon, if he were to get a chance to unify any of his titles, that would be great. Uh, so yeah, you know I think the sky's the limit for this kid. Yeah, keep a lookout for this guy. Twenty five years old. He's got the ring IQ of like a genius, and he's brilliant. He's got all the skills. He's a, he's yeah. a potential pound for pound star. I mean, it was now, there. Um, when, when you look at Mikey Garcia's past fights, it was there. You can see it. He just maybe the the yeah. um, opponents yeah. were incredible, but you've seen it in this guy, you know. And um, I picked him to win the decision. I thought it was going to be a close fight. I mean, but that power, wow. I mean. Juan Lopez, who had a phenomenal knockout ratio, 
and was considered, you know, a dangerous puncher. Only knocked down Salido one time in two fights. Garcia did it twice in one round. I mean, I think after that first round, Salido said, oh, man, I'm in for a long night. And that's what it was looking like. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, the third world title fight was Roman Rocky Martinez versus Juan Carlos Burgos, who's also a young up-and-coming fighter. This was the least publicized of the world title fights. It was for the WBO Super Featherweight title. Um, Roman Rocky Martinez retained his crown against the 25-year-old prospect in somewhat of a controversial draw. Going into the fight, Martinez had a record of 26-1 to 1, and Burgos had a record of 30 to 1. Now, many say Burgos deserved the win in this fight, D, and I personally scored it 7-5 to Burgos. So I'm not raving and saying it's an upset. I think the draw is a very legitimate decision, in my opinion. So I'm somewhat on the fence of the matter, but I'd like to see what you think about this, D, seeing as though you was there at the, at the ring. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, you know, like I said, I was there live. And um, it definitely looked like um, a Roma, um, um, Rocky Martinez uh, win. But, um, you know, when I got home, I was able to watch it on TV. And, you know, obviously you're going to see punches landed that you weren't able to see, being that you sit, you know, depending where you're sitting, you won't be able to see certain angles and certain punches landed as you would on TV. And, uh you know, I, I mean, I could be quite biased. I'm sorry, I'm Puerto Rican, and yes, but um, if the if it would have went to Bugos, you know, I wouldn't argue it. Um, a draw, you know, it, it's just I'm on the fence. I just think that these judges, the one judge had a one sixty one twelve for Martinez. I think that was you know, kind of wide, but. It just seemed like they must have been favoring his aggression more than anything because he was the aggressor this whole fight. Um, you know, Bugos, I mean, but when you see them, Bugos was the better fighter. I mean, if Bugos was there to land a jab more, stay in the middle of the ring, I think he would embarrass Rocky Martinez, to be honest. I mean, I, I don't think it's, 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 you know, it's evident that uh, Bugos is the better fighter. I just felt that he respected Rocky a little bit more than he was supposed to, and it kind of cost him a draw, you know. So you mm -hmm. know, um, he, he's he's uh, you know, he wants the rematch. He's ordering a rematch, and um, you know, hopefully they could do it again. I think he deserves a rematch, and hopefully we see that fight again. Yeah, now I think this should be a rematch, and I think it should get set up this year before either fighter takes the fight. Now, the fight was very back and forth because at times we saw great hands by Burgos and he could outbox Rocky Martinez at a distance with his jab and long combinations. But in the same round, we'd see Rocky Martinez applying good pressure and effective aggression, getting Burgos against the ropes and bullying him at times. And as you say, Burgos was clearly the better fighter out of the two of them, but Rocky was mm -hmm. having his way with him sometimes. Now, both fighters have the moments in this fight. And it's not a discredit to Martinez, who is a good fighter and fought well, to say that this was a robbery. I'd say I'd say that was a bit unfair. But um, what's your breakdown, Nick? You know what? Um, I guess to me, you know, and like uh, like the other gentleman said, if you watch it on TV, you're going to see a few different things on TV than you would. You know, when I cover live fights, if I get a bad seat, I'm better off watching it on TV because my report might not come out very accurate. But to me, obviously, Burgos was a far better fighter in the center of the ring. But at the same time, uh, I don't believe that Rocky Martinez, I mean, his moments were few and far in between. Because when he did get Burgos against ropes, Burgos wouldn't stay there. I think a lot of his punches were glancing blows. He'd land a few solid shots. But he was a little bit more slippery um, to me than, than what I'm hearing right now. I just don't think uh, he allowed Rocky Martinez to land flush, and he did land well off the ropes too. So, but but that did give the impression that Martinez was doing something. But in, if, to me, looking at it closely, I just thought those were glancing blows. Um, you know, similar to maybe like uh, when Pacquiao fought Marquez in the fight before, and Pacquiao won. I thought a lot of Pacquiao's blows 
were glancing blows, and that Marquez landed more flush, similar to that. And, and, and so I thought that, yeah, that, that um, Burgos won hands down, or, or he, he should have won right. hands down. As far as the judges go, um, when when you're a, 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 an employer and you hire in competent employees, it's not necessarily the employee's fault. It's it's the employer. You got to do research on who you're who you're appointing to judge a title fight. So I mean, you know, if the referee the judges aren't very good, uh, they're not up to judging a title fight, then it's not their fault that they're there. Somebody has to look into the to the commission and and who appointed those people in the first place. Because um, I don't I don't believe right. they, the two of them did a very good job. Okay, Mario, the floor is yours. What have you got to say about this fight? Well, I think Sean nailed it. You know, it, it was like aggression versus uh, calculated punishment, uh, you know, and, and the fact that he said that he scored it for Martinez and he was there, and then, you know, he didn't say it, but it sounded like he thought Burgos won the fight once he got back to the house. Uh, I've seen the fight three times, and I'm glad that no one's really said this right now. I'm glad I'm going to be the only one to say this. The first time I watched the fight, I was outraged that Burgos, that that fight was a draw. I I scored the fight 117-111 for Burgos. I felt like his punches did more damage. I felt like everything that Roman Martinez did, with the exception of a few of the middle rounds where he was really popping Burgos's head back, um, you know, it wasn't enough, though. You know, he was pressing the action, sure, but he wasn't getting much out of it. You know, I, I felt like the real damage was coming from Burgos' side, and, you know, I went to the school of uh, Max Kellerman for judging – uh, you know, the fighter that I'd least like to be in that ring in a particular round, in my opinion, loses the round. And uh, there were a lot more rounds that I would rather have been Burgos over Martinez. That being said, I did go back and watch the fight uh, the night that night and then uh, again in the morning. And um, I was able to give another round to Martinez, and I found another swing round. I, this fight was not a robbery at the end of the day. Uh, I, I, upon further analysis, it was... It was just one of those really tough fights to score at times, you know, because Martinez looked good at times doing certain things. And, and uh, you know, Nick was right. His, his moments were farther and fewer between. At the same time, they were there. They were evident. And at times, Bergoff laid back and, uh, you know, he didn't engage. That was one of the biggest things. You know, a lot of people thought this was going to be the best fight on the card because, you know, the fighters usually put on big fights, but Burgos refused to get into exchanges, and that might have been a really smart thing to do. Um, as, for, as far as the rematch, I don't think a lot of people are clamoring for it. I know both fighters have come out in the last couple of days and said they want a rematch. Um, I would love to see a rematch because I think that sixth round is more what the rematch is going to be like. That sixth round was really good and really competitive. It was like they were both saying in that sixth round, we're, we got to one of us has got to step up and win this fight. And uh, they both tried at the same time. You know, it's one of those things where you get fighters on the same molecular level trying the same things. And uh, the people that win are the fans. You know, that was one of the toughest rounds to judge. I think I gave it to Burgos, but it was a close competitive round. And uh, that's what I think the rematch would be like. So, yeah, let, let's see a rematch. I don't want it to end on a draw like this. I think both fighters are good enough to regroup, recalculate, and, uh, you know, get a decisive decision or, you know, even stop the, their opponent. Oh, okay, Mario. Note, um, I'm reading off here um, off of the uh, the promoters for Banner Promotions and Thompson Boxing on behalf of Burgos are uh, requesting the WBA, WBO for an immediate rematch. So, so that's a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now I think I, I think there should be a rematch. I really do think there should be a rematch. Um, now I think re, I think if there isn't a rematch, though, regardless, I think Burgos is a real smart fighter. And even if the rematch doesn't happen, I think he will be a world champion at some point, whether it's at 130 or 135. But he's 25. He's got a lot to learn, and no doubt he learned a lot from this fight. But he still has plenty to improve. I'd say we all saw what we're going to see from Rocker, but Burgos, we have a lot more to come. Now, Mario, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show and hope you can come on next week. Thank you very much. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, Mario, man. Thanks. Uh-huh. Mario, man, you got my number, man. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> That's right. No, I won't. I won't, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, John. Right. Right. Take care. Okay, now, I'd like to go back to comments made by Salido about the fight by saying that Garcia quit the fight, but if he's a real man, if he's a real Mexican, he needs to step up and have a rematch. What do you think about this, Dee? 
You know, um, and you see, and, and and we've been speaking about this pretty much a lot of the show about the Mexican mentality. Um, a lot of people felt, including, um, you know, Orlando Salido's corner, they felt Mikey Garcia took the easy way out. You know, it's funny that Robert Garcia, you know, said, you know, you know, stop it, stop it. But yet he criticized his own brother. You know when they about the Ortiz when Ortiz for Josecito Lopez when he had the broken jaw, you know they criticized Ortiz and he criticized his own brother. But yet, you know how ironic that he's telling his brother now, oh he had a broken nose all quick. Now I'm not there risking my health, so you know I can't tell a, a fighter whether you know what to do or not. But as fight fans. It's only right we're going to say, listen, people's fought in with broken jaws, broken ribs, and kept fighting, you know. And um, Salido's people felt, listen, yeah, we're getting our ass whooped in this fight, but we're coming on. You know, there was still four rounds left. Salido showed nothing that, you know, he was going to gas out. Now, maybe nothing would have happened. Maybe Garcia ends up stopping Salido late in the fight. You know, we don't know. Now, him saying, you know, real Mexicans don't quit, you know, that's kind of a shot towards Mikey Garcia. You know, how he's going to take it, we don't know. But being that the fight was so lopsided, I do not see Mikey Garcia giving Salido a rematch. And to be personally honest, I don't want to see a rematch. It was a whitewash. You know, yes, Salido was there, and he showed heart, but he got his ass whooped, man. That's just the bottom line. You know, his eye, his right eye was nearly shut, Margarito kind of shut almost. You know, you got knocked mm-hmm. down four times, tough. You know, power shots. Garcia was landing on this boy at will. He made a champion look like, you know, <laughs> he looked regular. He made, he made Salido... Look regular. That's not the Salido we saw against Gamboa. That's not the Salido we saw in Juanma. He made Salido look average. You know, so... All right, now. Okay, we're going to move on to the NBC card. And um, Gabriel Campillo lost a three-round knockout to undefeated Sergei Kovalev from Russia. Now, I'm going to bring on another co-host, and she's the host of a very own show on the ropes radio. She's called Jenna J. How's it going? How's it going, Jenna? Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, how you, how you doing, girl? Hello. Hello. Yeah, you're very welcome. Hey, all y'all. Okay, now, now, okay, let's move on to the fight. This was Kavala's step up in class, and he really nailed it with a third round KO. Now, what I'm going to say is, I hate to be a skeptic about this fight, but I really don't see. Kovalev. I don't really rate Kovalev that high, despite the impressive performance that he had. I think, of course, he's really strong. He's a really big puncher, and he's got the killer instinct, which a lot of them, which an offensive fighter needs. But there was no sort of method to this guy's offense. He was plodding forward in a straight line. He was swinging wildly, and he was often off balance. He didn't even cut off the ring in corner too effectively to me. He was sort of following and. For me, I think Campilio performed terribly. I think his footwork was off. He was really sloppy. What do you think about that fight, Jenna? Oh, uh, you know, it was a very interesting fight when it took place over at the uh, Mohegan Sun. I was, con- I was considering going out to it, but I mean, uh, you know, if, you know I-, I was very surprised. He came out so cold. And I know he's a slow starter, and I know he doesn't look good in the early rounds, but I mean, he came out exceptionally dry. He just didn't look himself in there. So, I mean, it, I think it's a little bit of two things in the fight. It's one, maybe the jet lag coming there late, can't be only being in the United States since Wednesday, played a factor. And also, you know, the guy that he was fighting was a strong guy that just caught him and kept catching him. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, D, what have you got to say about this fight? Quick yeah, um, it was, it was, it was a, a great performance, you know, um, we don't know, you know, rumor has it, Campillo was having trouble, and, um, you know, this wasn't a real good training camp, you know, but at the end of the day, you got to go out and fight. And we've seen Campillo in there with, with Shumanov and, um, you know, Tavares Cloud, and he got robbed in them fights. I mean, the Cloud fight, he was down early, got dropped twice in the first round, came back, dominated the whole fight. 
you know, Sergey Kovalov, he just destroyed Campillo. He walked through him. Now, his fundamentals might not be there, but this guy has – he hits hard. He, he's tall, and I think his, his future is right at 175. All right, Nick, what have you got to say about this fight? What's your breakdown? Well, you know, that fight, I just caught part of it on a replay. And uh, to be honest, I, I haven't seen Campillo fight too much. You know, I know he did get robbed, and uh just looked like uh, one guy was hitting harder than the other, and that will ruin your day. Guy's got a little bit heavier mm-hmm. hands than probably people suspect, and probably the same way that uh, – you know, uh, Golovkin's taking people out. People don't look at him and don't think much of him, but when his gloves land on you, uh, they tend to have a have an effect on you. <laughs> yeah, sure it does. All right. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to say too, we don't need to say too much more about that fight. Now, that segment was brought to you by the RCM Stop World Hunger. You can find info about this on www.realcombatmedia.com. There is also a link that you can follow if you'd like to make a donation to this charitable cause. The Post Harvest Project provides aid to those in need in the form of technology to help farms and fisheries in deprived areas. If you'd like to sponsor this show and grow your business with Real Combat Media Radio, then email us on advertising at realcombatmedia.com. That's advertising at realcombatmedia.com. Now, if you'd like to move on to the this weekend's fights and start the second half of the show, firstly, we have the WBC Interim Light Welterweight Championship between Lucas Matisse fighting the 26-year-old Mike Dallas Jr. Now, now, Mike Dallas Jr. is 26 years old and has a record of 19-2-1. to to his two losses come in the form of good competition. His biggest win came in his last fight, where he won the WBO Latino 140-pound title. Now, D, you see Dallas Jr., do you see him having much chance in this fight against Matisse, or do you see it as an out-and-out tune-up fight for Matisse, considering the fact that, from what we've saw, the guy's a beast? Ah, man. Matisse, Matisse's an animal. Um... I think Mike Dallas Jr. early on, I think he, he might look good the first three rounds, but he, he won't be able to keep Medici off him. And then, um you know, then the Grim Reaper comes, and that's what Medici is. He's going to be the Grim Reaper that night. And um, Mike Dallas Jr., I mean, if this if, if it goes past six rounds, I'd be surprised. You know, I mean, right now, Medici, you know, he's just, he's just right now performing – you know, out his mind. I mean, both his losses, we could argue that he won them against Judah and Alexander. And, and Dallas Jr. doesn't have the skills of an Alexander nor an Ozab Judah, you know. So this, this this is a Matisse fight that he wins within four rounds, five rounds. He's going to walk through Jr. I feel sorry for this kid. Yeah, I, I like I like Dallas Jr. I think he's a good fighter. I think he comes with excitement, even though he's got the physical advantages in height. He doesn't he doesn't take advantage of that and make it a boring fight. He likes to get involved. He likes to throw combinations. One thing with Matisse is he's a beast. He's a complete beast. But he lacks what he lacks is a great defense. Now, this doesn't seem to affect him too much because firstly he's got a brilliant chin, and he can, and he's got the ability to take shots. Secondly, his style completely takes over his opponent's game plan and just takes them off the game plan. They're always on the back foot, and they can rarely throw meaningful shots themselves. And thirdly, he, he wins by KO practically every fight. So even if someone lands a lot of shots, it's not going to go the distance anyway. Now, Nick, what do you think of the TSA as a fight moving forward? Well, uh, first of all, I'm excited about this fight, and I'm actually waiting for credentials so I can sit ringside over there. And um, Matisse, I mean, the guy, I mean, he's he's elevating his game. I mean, since that controversial loss to Alexander, I mean, he, he fought two guys in Argentina, and then he, uh, and he uh, I mean, I was at the fight where he took Humberto Soto apart. I mean, you could just feel the punches at ringside. The guy's got some thudding power. Um, and, and, that it, and a lot of people think he's going to take Garcia out, and uh, I might jump on that wagon. Um, but um, here's why I'm excited about this fight. I mean, nobody gave uh, Mike Dallas a chance in his last fight, not even Teddy Atlas, 
And um, I thought he can maybe pull it out by boxing, but he surprised everybody he outslugged this guy. And the reason is, I guess Virgil Hunter, his trainer, um, thought Mike Dallas is punching. With, you know, he's worried more about putting speed on his punches, slowed him down a little bit, had him put a little bit more power on his punches, and, and it worked for him. Now, I'm not saying he's going to, you know, outpower a Matisse in, in no kind of way, but. Um, in my mind, he's got good boxing skills. He's always had them as an amateur. If he can, he can use that height advantage and stay out in box, but at the same time, get all the way in at times to throw Matisse off balance. Then I'm curious to find out what will happen. And I'm and I'm saying that in a similar way to the way Carlos Molina fought a James Kirkland, who was a little bit shot looking to me. But he he went in and out on Kirkland. He bumped him when he had to. He just kind of kept him off balance with a little bit of herky jerk style. I don't know if Dallas Jr. can do that. I'm leaning towards Matisse, but uh, I'm intrigued by the fight. Um, you know, Mike Dallas' father just passed away, um, and I'm kind of wondering how that emotionally is going to play. Is the guy going to pull a Buster Douglas? Is that emotion going to funnel in a positive way where – you know, he pulls off the biggest upset of his career. I don't know, but um, I, those things are floating around in my head, and that's what I'm thinking about, and that's why I'm kind of intrigued by the whole thing. Okay, I've got a call, look, 1639. We're going to let Jenna J speak, and then we're going to get you on to add your voice now. Jenna J, what's your breakdown? Because we spoke earlier, and you said you're a big fan of Dallas Jr. Yeah, yeah, no, I've been uh, very interested by his rise, I think. The change for him was when uh, uh, you guys got some background now going on over there. But um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm very interested to to see this fight and see how it plays out. Mike Dallas Jr. has developed so much more under Virgil Hunter. I mean, the way he looked in his last two fights is excellent. Even his last three fights, the controversial loss to Herrera. Uh, you know, I think if anyone could give Lucas Matisse problems, it is Mike mm-hmm. Dallas Jr. And I know people are saying, well, you know, can he keep Lucas Matisse off? Well, that's the biggest factor in the fight. We've seen people under the tutelage of Virgil Hunter go in there and have a great game plan, look like they have the tools to beat a fighter, but their chin and, you know, their ability not to take the pressure is is what holds them back. We saw it with Chad Witherspoon against um, Jeff Mitchell. You know, had a great game plan. He was looking good early, and then all of a sudden, you know, his, his own chin failed him. So I think this is going to be a very interesting fight. But at the end of the day, as much as I like Mike Dallas Jr., I think the pressure will eventually get to him. I'm going to take Lucas Matisse by eight round stoppage. Okay, now thank you very much, Jenny J. I'm going to let you come on. One six three nine. What have you got to say? Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, first time calling you guys here. Glad to hear you guys got a show. Uh, yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm thinking Matisse. Sorry, what's your name and where are you from? It's uh, Jose Cohen here from Canada. Okay, go on. What's your breakdown on this fight? Well, I, I want to see Matisse, uh, Lucas Matisse, get a shot. I think it's it's about chance. It's about time, actually. He he gets to be some uh, some big uh, some big paydays, and I think he's kind of been uh, been kept down. And and I think after this match, he'll hopefully get the you know the big uh, the big paydays he deserves. Mhm. Okay, and um, is there anything else you'd like to ask any of the panel? No, man, that's it. Just wanted to call in and support you guys. That's all, man. Just coming back from work. All the best, and I'll be listening yeah. to you guys going forward, all right? Well, um, okay, well, take it to bed, Ria, that you are the first caller in on the Real Combat Media Radio boxing show, so I hope I hope that's cheered you up. All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. All right. Take care. Okay, yeah, now, my prediction for the Matisse fight, it's quite a difficult one. I'm pretty sure that Matisse is going to win, whether it's two rounds or whether it goes the distance. Now, I'm going to make a prediction for the middle rounds. I'm going to go for five, six, or seven. I think Mike Dallas Jr., he's got fast hands, and he throws some great combinations on the inside. But if he really thinks he's going to trade with Matisse, he's, he's got another thing coming. I think... He's, he's a bit too eager. He's a good fighter, but he's a bit too eager. And I, I, I can't see him going 12 rounds. Now, let's, um, let's move on. Now, 
the tough Turkish welterweight Selkuk Aydin, coming off his loss to Robert Guerrero, takes on Jesus Soto Carras in, um, in Las Vegas. Selkuk Mini Tyson Aydin comes all the way from Turkey with a 23 and 1 record. Jesus Soto Carras has a record of 26 for 8 for 3. But don't be mistaken, this Wally veteran has been in the ring with the best. Even Maidana, Rosado, Mike Jones, he's fought twice. He's beat Carson Jones. And surprisingly enough, he's also beat an aging Vince Phillips, would you believe? Now, um, Soto Carras has high level of experience, but Aiden is very strong, durable, and resilient. D, I'm interested to see what your breakdown in this fight is, because I'm not quite sure. Well, you know, you this is... Well, one one thing for sure of this fight is that the fans we're gonna win here. This is two fighters that like to fight in the trenches, or as they like to say, phone booth fighters. These fighters are gonna come forward. I think he's a tough son of a bee. You know, he comes in there and he just looks like you you insulted his mother. He just looks he just <laughs> just looks bad. You know, he just goes in there with with bad intent. I mean. Him and Guerrero, wow. I mean, that you know, that was a good fight. But, you know, Guerrero was just on another level. And, and you know, Soto Carras, man, I really felt he beat Mike Jones in that first fight. You know, I felt he got robbed. But, you know, they, they had to rematch. Mike Jones clearly won that. And, um, like you say, he's been in there with Rosado. He's been in there his last fight with Madonna, which was a hell of a fight. I mean, pretty much the fight that stole, that stole that whole card that night. And um, he's going to come and do what he does, Soto Carras. And that's come forward and, and fight. You know, he's going to come with that Mexican style. A. Dane is going to come with that, you know, bad intention style. You know, he got that sour. They both coming off losses. So, you know, you know the winner here, you know, gets some momentum going forward. But, um, you know, with, with this going, I just think Soto Carras, I wouldn't want to call him damaged goods. But, you know, he, he's kind of that card that, you know, you're like, damn, you know, if I buy it, but I don't know if I could take a, a you know, a long, a, a eight-hour drive with it, you know. So I think that, that that's Soto Carras. You know what you could get from him, but I don't know if, you know, when the fight starts going into deep waters, I think he's going to drown, you know. And um, I like A.D. in this fight. I like him to come back and rebound from that Guerrero loss and, and pretty much get back in the welterweight picture. You know, there's a lot of names out there for him. So, you know, I, um, should be a hell of a fight, man, hell of a fight. Yeah, I, I agree that it's going to be a good fight. It's not it's not the highest quality of um, competition, but now Soto Carras is a forward-thinking technical fighter, but he's not a Robert Guerrero forward-thinking technical fighter. He's not a Felix Trinidad forward-thinking technical fighter. Now, He's a C-level fighter at best, but the question is, that was, remains to be seen, where do we rate, what grade do we give Soto Kaidin? Because his only loss is against Robert Guerrero, who, if you don't know already, I love Robert Guerrero. I think Robert Guerrero's brilliant. But his yeah. wins have been mostly quite convincing wins against really low-level opposition. So, Jenna, how do you grade Soto Kaidin? Where do you think he falls in between Robert Guerrero and then the other opposition that he's faced? Um, who do I rank? Sorry, I just missed that. What was that? Yeah, how Maybe. do you rate Salka Kai on a scale in between Robert Guerrero and then the competition that he's faced besides Robert Guerrero? Like, what do you think is going to go? What do you think is going to happen in this fight? Oh, uh, you know, I think he's more. To be honest, I uh, I think he's a guy that was positioned into a title and he really wasn't ready for the big stage. I don't see him as an elite fighter at 147. I don't see him really as a great fighter at 147. He fought Robert Guerrero. He had a decent fight against him. But, you know, I really just see him as a guy that will contend for a title and most often, more often than not, lose. Now, the fight that he has coming up against Frost, I think it's a fight that's really tailor-made for him. I think it's a fight he'll look good, and I think it's a fight he'll easily outbox Frost and win. But do I ever see him, you know, getting up to an elite level and, and, and being, you know, anywhere near Robert Guerrero's uh, level in terms of fighters? No. I think he's just going to be more of a fringe contender. Mm-hmm. Now, Nick Bellafato, what have you got to say about this fight? Are you interested in this fight? 
Yo, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I hear people talking. I, I mean, I was at the Guerrero fight, and Guerrero was that's his first move up to 147. You know, uh, he was relying. On, you know, he came off a long layoff, and he still beat the guy um, moving up. You know, to 147, basically because of the fact that I deem is kind of one dimensional. I mean, the guy loads you up with his shots. Uh, you can see him coming, but he's in t- terrific shape. And and I agree with the boxing maniac. There. I'm sorry, what's your name? The other guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. The boxing maniac. There you go. I agree with you in a way. Well, you kind of came short. Uh, you said damage goods. I think Soto Carlos has a little bit of mileage on him and started to show up in his last fight when he got stopped. I mean, he's fought a lot more high level guys than Ideen. Ideen's kind of been avoided. So. Uh, in that sense, Ideen is a little fresher where Soto Paras isn't. So I, I, I see Ideen stopping him. Again, it's going to be a fan-friendly fight because the guys are going to be right there for each other. But, you know, uh, Ideen's a strong guy, and uh, Karras is going to be there. And plus, with a little bit of mileage on him, um, I, I, I see Ideen uh, stopping him or doing some damage there. Yeah, I think um, I think... Whilst it's not a conclusive decision, I think we're all sort of on the same page. I predict Ideen in the late rounds. I think Karras will probably get the better of the boxing up to maybe the early rounds, maybe the first two or three rounds. But guys like Ideen, they have their own way of getting of creeping up upon a guy if they're not too careful. And I don't, th- I don't think Karras is skillful enough to win rounds without receiving lasting damage, which will affect his performance later in the fight. And, and as I said, I think um, Ideen in the later rounds. Now, other fights coming your way include a Showtime production coming out of Huntington, New York on January 25th. Top in the bill will be the 2007 gold, medal, gold medalist at the World Amateur Championships, Demetrius Bubu Andrade, looking to extend his undefeated record of 17 fights against Freddy Hernandez. Also on the card, action at 140 between Raymond Serrano and Emmanuel Taylor. On January 26th in Chihuahua, Mexico, Hugo Cazares fights Ray Perez in the bantamweight division. Whilst on the same card in Morelia, Mexico, Jorge Paez Jr. fights Francisco Fuentes. This is Real Combat Media Radio bringing you news and discussion from around the globe on Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. You can find us at www.realcombatmedia.com or simply type in Real Combat Media into your search engine. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter at Real Combat Media and like our Facebook, realcombatmedia.com. Now, moving on to um, the awards, we come to the last segment of... Oh, I'm sorry, we've got one more fight to discuss. This is the um, Sergei Dinsorek versus Brian Vera. Now, Sergei Zinzurik won and defended the WBO light middleweight title six times, a title which he didn't lose. He actually vacated it to take on the current middleweight kingpin, Sergio Martinez, his only loss to date, which we can all understand. Brian Vera comes out of Texas. He has a record of 26-21 for six. His biggest win came in his last fight, which was the rematch against Sergio Martinez, in which he took down the... NABO middleweight title. His record is rather unimpressive, but don't be deceived. He comes to fight and he doesn't go down either. Now, on paper, dude, this seems like quite a straightforward fight to me, but what do you make of this fight? We all know Zin Zurich's last two fights have been a loss and a draw, but he seems nailed on for this one. Would you agree? Um, you know, since it was last fight when he fought uh, uh, Jonathan Gonzalez, and we know Gonzalez had the weight issues in that fight. And um and, and I think Gonzalez is a, a, a fighter that's real easy to hit that I felt was Taylor Mathens in Zurich because he's such a technical fighter. But um he really he did not look good. In fact, I felt he lost that fight. And um I just think the judges, you know, they, they call it a draw, which I mean I I didn't have a big issue with it, but I felt that he lost. He he just didn't look himself, you know. He looked flat. Um, it it, it he just didn't look good at all. I mean, in, in so many ways, you know. Um, Gonzalez was was you know um coming forward, landing shots on Zurich. You know, his head movement wasn't there. 
He wasn't landing combinations. It, it, it just didn't look good for him. And we know with Brian Vera, we know with Brian Vera that he's going to be, he's going to come and he's going to come to fight, man. He's been in there with a lot of fighters. I mean, his resume speaks for himself. And I feel Brian Vera will be able to put pressure on Zinzirik and weigh him down. Now, whether it will be a knockout or a decision, I like Brian Vera in this fight. Well, um, yeah, that surprises me. Um, I like fighters like Zinzirik because he's a real experienced Euro technician. He stands up and he uses a brilliant southpaw jab with great timing to keep his opponents off balance. He has a great pocket defense, and he relies very much on his counter-punching abilities. Now, Jenna, what's your breakdown on this fight? Well, I think this is actually going to be the most competitive fight of the weekend out of all the fights that are out there. I was ringside for Zinzurek's fight against Sergio Martinez, and I watched him, and I watched him slowly get broke down, knocked down over and over. And then his very next fight, you see him a year and a half later, he's gone from his off. He didn't look like the same fighter anymore. He looked like a shell of himself. You know, I thought it was a very close fight. I, I actually scored that fight a draw. And I mean, that's all it really should have been. Neither guy deserved a victory. Going into this fight with Brian Beer, Zinzurek is actually in for a really, really, really tough fight. I mean, Brian Beer, he's fought guys at 160, 168. You know, he's fought guys his whole life that are generally bigger than him. And I think Zinzurek is a guy that can actually have some struggles with Beer. I would not be surprised at all to see an upset in this fight. But if I had to pick a winner, I'm going to take Sergey Zinzurek by close, and I mean close, majority decision. Okay, uh, this is quite surprising for me. That, um, I didn't think I'd get this reaction. Now, in my opinion, the reason why Sergey had such a nightmare against Martinez was because of the angles that Martinez presented and his great footwork, taking into account the fact that Zinzurek, although being a great technician, is quite a static fighter. He doesn't cope against a guy who can get in and out with such a lightning pace. I thought it was Martinez being special as opposed to Zinzorik being limited or B-class in some way. Now, Vera just doesn't bring these assets to the table or present any others, which suggests he's going to penetrate the defences in Zorik. Um The thing with Vera is a likeable, exciting fighter who applies pressure and throws in volume, but the reason why he's six losses is because he seems to just go off instinct and he doesn't really think things through too much. I don't want to take credit away from his win against um, Sergio Mora, but he outworked and out, he, he outworked and deserved a win. But Sergio Mora, in my opinion, is clearly a better fighter. He just didn't tactically box correctly. He, he was lazy. He allowed Vera to get him on the ropes. Now, Nick, do you agree with me? Would you say that this is nailed on to Zinzi uh, say that again. Do you think? Would you agree with me, or would you agree with Dee? Do you think um, Zinzurik nailed on for this one, or do you think Brian Vera might um, well, cause a bit of a stir? You know what? I, I'm one guy, and I I can only see so many fights and cover so many things. Uh, I haven't seen too much of Brian Vera, but I did see Sir Sir uh, Zinzurik against Martinez, and I thought he was a highly skilled fighter. And all the more reason to uh, give praise to Martinez, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head. A uh, little step back here for Martinez, and Zinzurik fell short, and he stepped back in and countered. Footwork was uh, great by Martinez. Uh, and, again, Zinzurik, uh, uh, just like a great technical fighter, uh, he just met his match in Martinez, who's outstanding. If, um, and what I'm getting the impression and listening in on the conversation is that in Zurich, is, uh, uh, you know, after the after the Martinez fight, he probably went awry in training and just wasn't doing the things that kept him at the same level. So probably he had some sort of mental breakdowns. He had he had something going on with the training. But I suspect if if he's a guy that I've seen against Martinez, you know, uh, against a guy less than Martinez, he'd be able to handle him. So uh, uh, it's all in the preparation. If he does his homework and and he's in tip top form, I don't see why. Uh, with his amateur background, he can't uh, deal with a guy who, uh, you know, that Sergio Mora gave a hard time. Yeah, but when he fought, when he okay. fought Jonathan Gonzalez, he didn't give him no angles or nothing. He he, is, he comes straight forward and still struggle, mm-hmm. and that and that's why I'm going with Vera in this fight. And I think Vera 
you know, he sit on his punches better than Jonathan Gonzalez, and he's been there with the better opposition. I think he's going to look at Zinzirik like, listen, you went for a long night. I've been in here with monsters before. So, I mean, that's why I'm picking, um, you know, Vera in this fight. But, you know, it might it might be a good one. Let's see. Let's see if Zinzirik come to fight for this one. Okay, so there we have it, guys. Um, the panel split on this one. We've got uh, my prediction is clear. Zinzirik is more skillful, he's wiser, he's more experienced, and he's been in there and done it on the world level a number of times. Vera's a really game fighter, but the only way he could possibly win is by overwhelming Sergey the way he did against Mora. And despite the fact that Zinzirik has not long moved up in weight, I don't see this happening because he's six foot tall, he's a strong, durable fighter. And by no means will he be a small middleweight. Now, I, I picked Jim Zurich by landslide, to be honest, guys. Now, we have a call I'd like to bring him on. Hello, how's it going? You're live on Real Combat Media Radio. What's going on, man? What's going on, man? This is uh, um, the Dominican Dream, man, on Twitter. All hey, right, Jim, man. how you doing? Yeah, John, that, that, that's a good friend of mine right there. Yeah, man. All right, uh, how's it going, man? What, what would you like to say on the air? Nah, man, I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, a couple of things, man. I mean, you guys talking about um, Vera Zinzirik. You know, that's not a fight that I don't think any fan would salivate over. Um, you know, I don't think it's a bad fight, but it's, I don't think it's a good fight either. You know, Brian Vera, he's just a lackluster fighter. And Zinzirik is, is, is a good fighter, man, but like a lot of these European cats, you know, he's not a volume puncher, man. He don't let his hands go. I mean, if these European cats would just let their hands go, man, they would be, you know, much more uh, welcome over here. You know what I mean? But he just doesn't let his hands go. You know, jab, 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 jab. I just do without that fight, man. I mean, um, but I want to know your guys' thoughts, man. I'm, you know, I'm hearing talks, outrageous, all things of talks. Of Brad I'm watching, yeah, I, I wouldn't start. Bradley Gamboa, what, what, what do you guys think about that 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 preposterous proposal? Oh man, that that'd be that'd be horrible, man. They make Gamboa go up to one from one thirty to one forty seven to fight Bradley, especially the way he looked in his last fight. But I mean, boxing is funny, man. Gamboa go up there. And, and, and give him work, but that's not a fight I want to see. Gamboa, where he's at, there's plenty of fighters for him. Even Mikey Garcia said he wants a Gamboa fight. So he should, you know, I mean, unless it's for the money, you know, it's a business at the end of the day, and fighters will be willing to go up north a couple of um, weight classes for a big payday. And that's the reason why Guerrero went up. Not only he wanted a Mayweather fight, but he had to prove it, and he did. Beating two, you know, two legit, legitimate welterweights. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I gotta um, get, I gotta, I gotta get in here on this. But I mean, I think it's it's a case of Bob Arum eating Yorkie's Gamboa. I mean, you know, he, he basically he lost Gamboa to Fifty Cent, even though he got a lump sum of money. All the fights he's getting offered are fights that he's gonna get executed in. Seriously, I mean, look, even against a, a guy that's a non-puncher like Timothy Bradley, I think Gamboa would get knocked out. I just don't think it's a match for two. Okay, guys. Okay, guys, we need to move on. We've got 15 minutes left. It's time to announce and discuss the Real Combat Media Awards 2012. Now, firstly, we've got the KO of the year. The five candidates are Mikel Kessler's round four knockout of Alan Green. We've got Juan Manuel Marquez, Manny Pacquiao four. We've got Danny Garcia, Eric Morales two. We've got Dennis Lebedev, Santander Silgado. We've got Gary Russell Jr. versus Robert Castenza. Now, I'd like each panelist to give their give their interpretation of who they think won and why. Now, I'll start off with you, Dave. Oh, I mean, it's 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 clear as daylight for me. Um, there is Marquez over Pacquiao, and um, you know, we we spoke about it. Is the the fight the magnitude of the fight? Who was involved in this fight? What happened in the past three fights? But there was no definitive winner. There was three controversial decisions. And finally, and finally, we got a definitive winner. And not only did we get that, we got it by 
a, I mean, a hellacious knockout. I mean, he had Manny Pacquiao counting sheep, man. I mean, he he put on face. I thought he, I, I thought he killed a boy, man. I was I said call the police because I thought this guy was dead. You know that was crazy, and that's Pacquiao. I mean, he's shown a good chin. This is not a fighter who said, well, you know, no, Pacquiao, he, he hasn't got lost KO on, when he was a baby, his early in his career by body shots. He's been in there with tough, rugged Mexican Hall of Fame fighters, and none of them knocked him down. And then Marquez does that in a, in a fight, and it was a great fight. And... Marquez, that that that's knockout of the year. I mean, just the way he, ooh, that was ooh, that was ugly. Okay, okay, maniac. Um, I was gonna have my piece, but you said everything I want to say. I completely oh, I'm agree. Sorry. I agree with you. <laughs> hey, that, that's fine. Hey, that's fine, man. That's fine. I completely agree. I voted with Marquez. What's your vote, Nick? Knockout of the year. You know, the, the boxing maniac robbed me on that one too. He hit it on the head. But I, I do want to add something. Um. You know, Pacquiao was winning that fight. Uh, he was winning that fight up to that point, and he does something that I teach my boxers never to do, walk in with a lazy jab, ran right into it. The, the other thing and the other reason it can't be Garcia and Kessler is that Garcia was fighting a guy that's past his, past his prime, way way past his prime. Um, he, he's ripe for a knockout with, with a good shot, even though he's a warrior. And then the other thing is Alan Green, Hasn't looked good either. I mean, he got knocked out by uh, Glenn Johnson with a glancing blow, and and then you know, so that's that's the other reason they can't be knocked out of the year. But otherwise, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I thought he was dead too. All right, All right Jenna, what's your call? Oh, without a doubt, it has to be Marquez's KO stick win over Pacquiao. You can't take out an elite fighter the way that he did without getting that kind of war. And I'm going to keep it just short and sweet there. That was a knockout of the year, and I can't see anything else that could possibly beat it. Okay, we're all united, and I'd like to say, so were the voters. The winner was Juan Manuel Marquez versus Manny Pacquiao for surprise, surprise now. Our next award would be the upset of the year. Now, the candidates were Sonny Boy Yarrow's win over long reigning flyweight champion, Fong Sang Lek Wong Jun Kam. Number two, Randall Bailey's one-punch KO of Mike Jones. Number three, Josito Lopez win over Vicious Victor Ortiz. And Danny Garcia's win over Amir Khan. Now, D, who do you think won this one? Hello? Jenna? Yeah, Dave, yeah. who do you think won this one? No, go on, well, Dave, who do you think um, won this one? Upset of the year. Um, I'm, I'm going with Jose Cito Lopez over Victor Ortiz. Um, this was a fight that Jose Cito Lopez, was just, he's coming up from 140 to 147. The fight, a hard, a hard punch in, in Victor Ortiz. In fact, this was... They, they they pretty much try to feed him to Ortiz. The Canelo Ortiz fight was already signed and sealed. All he had to do was beat Lopez. That's just to show you the confidence they had in Lopez, you know, his chances of winning this fight, which were none. And he went in there, not only he beat Victor Ortiz, he broke his jaw. A junior welterweight went up there and broke Ortiz's jaw. That 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 was magnificent. I mean, I want to say 97% of people anywhere had Ortiz win, including myself. I had Ortiz to win that fight by knockout. And um, what Lopez did that night was, was magnificent. I mean, not that he was blowing Ortiz out the water neither. I mean, I, I had Ortiz winning that fight close, but, you know, Lopez, he did what he had to do. He broke his jaw, and that's all she wrote. That's all right, Dave, the now, for me. Now, okay, now, I'm I'm going to be honest, guys. I didn't pick that fight. I picked um, Sonny Boy Yarrow's win over Pong fight like Bon Jun can because the fact is, the guy was undefeated in 20 fights and Yarrow had 10 losses on his career. The upset was made even bigger by the fact that Yarrow was beating his next fight against Koshiaki Igarashi from Japan. He had only 17 pro fights. Jenna, what's your call on this? Well, you know, I gotta take actually your pick there. Sonny Barjo's win over Juan Junkum, just because of how long Juan Junkum reigned as champion. I know people can say that 
Juan Junko might have been towards the end because, you know, in his very next fight, he got knocked out by a guy that was like 17 and 20 or something like that. But, uh, I mean, just the fact that you beat someone that, that was a legend of the sport like that, you have to give him the ups of the year. Okay, Nick Bellafato, what have you got to say about this one? Oh, well, the way you describe it, I go with the uh, the one you guys picked with the Thai fighter. I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't see that fight, and I can much less pronounce things. But I, I like the Jose. With my limited knowledge, I would go with Jose Cito based on what I know. You can't give it to Garcia. On is uh, an excellent hit-and-move boxer for a reason. He can't really take a good shot. Um, uh, but other than that, I go with Jose Cito just based on what I know. Otherwise, if I've seen the other fight, I'd probably go with the, the tie fight the way you're describing it. Okay, so it's three to one. But I'd like to say the RCM voters have counted. And D, it's your call. The winner is Jose Zito Lopez versus Vic, Vic, Vicious Victor Ortiz. Now, the, now 2012 brought a number of great fights. Many of them lived up to the already big reputation that they had. Some of them came as a surprise. The 2012 Fighter of the Year candidates are as follows. Juan Manuel Marquez again versus Manny Pacquiao 4. Rio Salvarado. Robert Guerrero versus Andre Berto. And Orlando Salido versus Juan Manuel Lopez 2. Now, I personally take Manuel Marquez versus Manny Pacquiao for this. Basically because I grew up on this trilogy. I grew up on the trilogy. I grew up on the quadrilogy. I believe it's a brilliant... I believe it's going to be one of the most historical series of fights ever. And this one lived up. It actually didn't go 12 rounds for once, which I would have liked it to, but the knockout at the end was tremendous. Now, Jenna, what's your call for fight of the year? You know, I'm going to take Brennan Rios versus Mike Alvarado. While the magnitude of Pacquiao versus Marquez and, and the way that fight played out was certain, certainly definitely you know, something amazing, but I, I just really got to go with the fight that's just absolutely, you know, nonstop. Two guys reading each other's chest constantly, big blows the entire time, no lulls. That's got to be Rio versus uh, Rio versus Alvarado, but I can see an argument for Pacquiao Marquez. Okay, Nick Bellafato, what have you got to say about this one? Well, I was flip flop until Jenna reminded me of the fight. I was actually uh, at that fight to cover Donaire and uh, Rio Alvarado. I got to go with that. I mean, the magnitude of Pacquiao uh, Marquez. Um, you, you would think that would be the fight of the year. It was a good fight, but yeah, there was no lulls in the uh, Rio Alvarado. I'm, I'm going to go with that one. Okay, D, what have you got to say about this one? Try and keep it brief. We've got eight minutes to go. All right. Um, it, it's tough, man, and, and, and exactly like Jenna and Nick. I, I, I really, I really want to go Alvarado Rios because that was a rock and sock em kind of fight where. You we already knew what what we what to expect, but I'm gonna go with Juan Marcelito too. Um, you know this was a fight where um, you know Juan Mar had the chance to redeem himself. It's Puerto Rico versus Mexico. I mean, whenever those two get in the ring, you know pride is on the line. You know, country bragging rights, and um, these guys went at it, man. And and I, I think. These are all good candidates, even uh, the Pacquiao uh, Marquez fight. But I'm gonna just go go ahead with Salido um, one more two. Okay, now um, we're, we're quite split on that one, and I'd like to announce the winner of the 2012 fight of the year is Juan Manuel Marquez versus Manny Pacquiao for not too much of a surprise. Now, okay, now the most prestigious award we'd like to offer is the 2012 fight of fighter of the year. We've got four candidates. We've got Danny Garcia, we've got Nanito Donaire, we've got Robert Guerrero, and we've got Lucas Matisse. Can we sort of get a 30-second verdict by... We'll start with you, Jenna. Um, between all those fighters right there, I, I also got to go with Nanito Donaire. He fought four times in 2012. You know, he, he unified the belt, and he proved himself to be one of the top three pound strong fighters in the world, so I'm taking Nanito Donaire. <laughs> I agree, I agree, Jenna. I think Nanito Donaire, he fought four times, he moved up in weight, he's unified belts. People like Jeffrey Mafabula are completely underrated. These are top quality elite opposition. Now, Nick Bellafato, what have you got to say about the fighter of the year? Uh, Donaire, complete runway. I mean, like you said, he, he fought, he moved up to a new division to begin with. 
and he basically started cleaning it out. He, he went. He didn't start from the bottom up. He started from the top. He, he, he wiped the slate clean. He's got Rigondo to go, and he's probably next up. You got to go with Donaire. Okay, D. What you got to say? I'm, I, I, I really. And I had this. I had this discussion. To me, there's no fight of the year. In my eyes. I really think this is one of the years where, what? you know. It, it hasn't been clear cut. Now, Donaire, I can, I can see people, Donaire, but being all say, you know, he's tailor made for him. I mean, he'd be, you know, Matabula, you know, he's a solid fighter, you know, and it, I mean, if you have to give it to somebody, you know, I can see, but me, I'm going to just go with Danny Garcia, being that, you know, you know, people could say, well, I mean, Morales, you know, Khan. I mean, he, he was underdog in these fights, and he won. So, you know, I, I, I like, I'm going with Danny Garcia. But to be honest with you, I don't think nobody wins fight of the year. This is not a year where you can say, he's definitely no hands down the fight of the year. I don't see it this year. Not even though now. Okay, now um, the comeback of the year. Uh... The candidates are, the candidates are, sorry, let me find the candidates. We've got Arthur Abraham, we've got Pansy de Leon, we've got Devin Alexander. That's what we've got. Who do you think, Dave? Um, I mean, I, I like De Leon, man. I mean, ever since, you know, the one my loss, I mean, he got blitz in one round. Ever since he's he's been he's been doing he's been fighting solid competition and he's been winning so I'm I'm gonna go with De Leon in this one. Okay, Jenna, come back of the area if you got. I gotta go outside the box this one here and take none of the uh, choices that are selected. I'm gonna go with Asselino Freitas coming out of a six year retirement to beat up Michael Oliveira, an undefeated mm. guy in Brazil. He was a ten to one underdog. I'm Good taking Asselito, Popo Freitas. Okay, Nick, what have you got to say? 30 seconds. Uh, can you repeat the choices real quick? Arthur Abraham, Daniel Ponce de Leon, Devin Alexander. Uh, you know what? I'll go with Devin Alexander just because he, uh, he beat Maidana up and, uh, you know, he took on some tough fighters, moved up in weight and looked a lot stronger at, at the new weight. Okay, now, my pick was Arthur Abraham because he had a terrible Super 6. He come back, he became a two-weight world champion against Robert Stieglitz, who'd been the champion since 2009. He put himself back into the position that he was in years ago. I'd like to announce that Arthur Abraham was the winner. Now, quickly, we've got the prospect of the year. We've got Keith Thurman. We've got Jose Benavidez. We've got Jason Vela. We've got Dante Wilder. D, shoot, quick time. Oh, uh, oof. That was a tough one. Man, I guess it's a toss up with Wilder and Thurman, but um, I mean, I know I'm gonna take, I'm gonna get a lot of um, a lot of flack for this, but I'm gonna go with Wilder. Mhm. Okay, Jenna, what have you got? Yeah, that's a tough one here. What you got in front of us, but uh, uh you know, he didn't fight. I think he only fought once uh, in 2011. But I uh, Keith Thurman. I think this guy's got the biggest upset upside. So I'll take Keith Thurman. Yeah, he, he fought twice. He also fought Orlando Laura. Go on, Nick. What you got to say? You know what? Just based on seeing Keith Herman and what he did this year against his, uh, you know, um, Carlos Quintana, I'd have to I'd have to go with Herman. Just how he looked in the fight this year, he must have done something right out there. Yeah, personally, I would also go for Thurman. I'm looking forward to his 2014 more than anybody's. He completely flattened Carlos Quintana, who's a really experienced, skillful fighter. And the winner was, by a landslide, it was Keith Thurman, guys. Now, I'd like to announce next week's show, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, Tuesday morning, 12 a.m. UK time, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, okay, guys, we've come to the end of the show, unfortunately, our very first show. But do not fear, we're here to stay. T tune in next week. If you want to sponsor the show, contact us on advertising at realcombatmedia.com. Also, follow us on Twitter at Real Combat Media or type us in on Facebook and add us. Now, for, the, for now, we're out of time. I'm John Campbell. I'm going to be here talking boxing. The Maniac. 
with with Nick Bella flat out, with Jenny J on the ropes, and we're going to be here for a long time. Take care. See you till next time. Follow me on Twitter, Jenna on the ropes. Peace.